Welcome to Search for the Truth. I'm Pamela Robertson. And I'm Patrick Powell. Today we're going to investigate two of the world's most prominent and influential men to determine, once and for all, which one holds the truth. Joseph Smith, a man who claimed to be visited by God and given golden tablets by the angel Moroni, from which he penned the Book of Mormon. This book provided a foundation for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the LDS Church, and teaches about a New Testament of Jesus Christ. Today, Mormonism flourishes in the U.S. and around the world. Was Joseph a deceiver, a madman, or a gifted prophet who was given divine instruction and the gift of translation to further God's kingdom? Jesus Christ, a man who claimed to be God, performed miracles and even raised the dead, including himself. Since his resurrection, he has been followed by countless men and women throughout the world who have placed their eternal hope in him alone. His teachings, found in the Bible, provide the foundation of Christianity. Did he become a God through the faithful keeping of his ordinances, or has he always been the only true God? The Bible claims to be the inspired Word of God, and it commands us to test all things, hold fast that which is good. Joseph Smith's writings claim to be another testament of Jesus Christ, and proclaim to the world that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth. LDS Apostle Orson Pratt once stated, Convince us of our errors of doctrine, if we have any, by reason, by logical arguments, or by the Word of God, and we will be ever grateful for the information. Christianity and Mormonism, are they compatible? Do they share a common history? Both claim Jesus is the Christ. Both refer to the teachings of the Old Testament. Both claim to be the truth. However, you may be surprised to discover that there are significant differences. Let's now examine these two men and their teachings. According to the LDS Church's Gospel Principles Manual, every person who has ever inhabited the earth is a spirit brother or sister. The first spirit born to our heavenly parents was Jesus Christ. So he is literally our elder spirit brother. We needed a savior to pay for our sins and teach us how to return to our heavenly father. Our father said, whom shall I send? Two of our spirit brothers offered to help. Our oldest brother, Jesus Christ, who was then called Jehovah, said, here am I, send me. Satan, who was called Lucifer, also came, saying, Behold, here am I, send me. After hearing both sons speak, our Heavenly Father said, I will send the first. Because our Heavenly Father chose Jesus Christ to be our Savior, Satan became angry and rebelled. According to the Bible, Jesus is the Almighty Creator of all, including the angels. In Colossians 1, we read, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. The Bible also teaches that Jesus has eternally been God, while Joseph Smith teaches that Jesus had to achieve Godhood. There could be no greater contrast than the Jesus of the Bible with the Jesus of Mormonism. Uh, in the Bible, and according to history as we believe in the actual work of Jesus Christ, uh, He was God in the flesh. He was eternal with God, co-equal, uncreated. Well, in Colossians 1.16, by Him, Jesus Christ, all things were created, including Satan, you say, are you sure? Listen, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. You say, what things in heaven that are invisible did Jesus Christ create? Four are listed. One, thrones. Two, dominions. Three, principalities. Four, powers. All the ranks of angelic beings from Satan to archangels to seraphim and cherubim were created, notice this, by him, Jesus, and for him, and he's before all things. And I say, well, that's an amazing statement because there's an infinite chasm 
than between Jesus Christ, creator God, and Satan, creature, who has sinned. In bearing testimony of Jesus Christ, President Gordon B. Hinckley spoke of those outside the church who say Latter-day Saints do not believe in the traditional Christ. Hinckley responded, No, I don't believe in the traditional Christ. The traditional Christ of whom they speak is not the Christ of whom I speak. For the Christ of whom I speak has been revealed in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times. Nothing existed prior to the Creator, which is Christ. Uh, John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, just two places, for example, make it very clear that Jesus created all things and that nothing existed prior to that creation. When we consider the intricacies of all creation, like the detail and marvel of the human eye, or the DNA code, or the orbit of the planets, it's clear that there is a perfect God in control. Does Joseph Smith teach of the same perfect and eternal God as the Bible? Let's examine the physical aspects of God. According to Joseph Smith, the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also. However, in John chapter 4, we are told, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The Bible also states, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God has existed for eternity. He alone is the eternal, omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent creator. Amazingly, in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 345, we are told, I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so you may see. He was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth, the same as Jesus Christ himself did. It was um, Orson Pratt, I believe, who said, if we should take a million worlds like this and number their particles, we should find there are more gods and their particles matter in those worlds. So that's a lot of gods. There are many people who actually think there are many gods out there somewhere in the universe. But the Bible teaches emphatically that that is wrong. Listen to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, 4. There is no God but one. Oh, but wait a minute. Qualification. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, I mean all kinds of people project into the universe imaginary deities or gods they relate to in one way or another, but the question is this, are they really there or are they just here? And the Bible says through the Apostle Paul, they're only in here. There's one God out there. In the Christian or the biblical concept of God, He's the great eternal one, uncreated, uncaused, all-powerful, ever-present, all-knowing. And uh, that is not only a Christian understanding of God, that is also the Judaic understanding of God. In Mormonism, God is simply an exalted man. He was born as a man, he was conceived in a natural way, and by adherence to a system of Mormonism in a previous world and a previous life, through his good works, in accordance with that system, he became God. That's Joseph Smith's understanding of God. Indeed, his most radical reconstruction of Christianity begins at the point of how he redefined God. Man's natural tendency is to bring God, the Creator, down to our level. The temptation is then to elevate man to godhood. To have the ambition to become a god, that was the lie of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. He promised Eve she could become a god. And you remember um, Brigham Young uh, speaking in the Mormon tabernacle. He said, the devil told the truth. We don't fault Mother Eve for eating the forbidden fruit. That's how we become gods. So Mormonism takes the lie of the serpent. It's based on the saying that the lie of the serpent is the truth. 
Consider the Egyptians, the very ones who supplied the papyrus from which Joseph Smith brought forth his Book of Abraham. The Egyptians were convinced that some of them were gods. In fact, their entire funeral culture was designed to equip themselves for their next life as they traveled on in the spirit world as gods. However, the God of the Bible tells us, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. This and many other passages directly conflict with Joseph's teachings that there are many gods and that men can become gods. The Bible says, Before me there were no gods formed, Isaiah 43.10. Neither shall there be after me. That means that all the Mormon teaching about many gods is false. It means there was never a god before this god. It also means that Mormon men will never become God. In Joseph Smith's Pearl of Great Price, Abraham and his wife Sarah are on their way to Egypt when Abraham is visited by the Lord, saying, The Egyptians will find beauty in your wife and will kill you and take her for their own. And in verse 24, God tells Abraham to lie in order to spare his life. The book of Abraham uh, began by authorizing lying by God. Okay, where uh, Abraham goes down into Egypt and he tells the Pharaoh that uh, his wife is actually his sister. This is similar to the Bible version, only in the book of Abraham, God is telling Abraham to lie. God's ninth commandment states, you shall not bear false witness. And the final book of the Bible warns that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Therefore, according to the Bible, God would never condone lying. Many questions arise from all of this confusion. Is there only one God or billions of gods? Why would God give us the Bible for instruction and life molding and later give us another testimony of Jesus Christ only to contradict each other? Does God make mistakes? With the concept of God being so drastically different between the Bible and Joseph Smith's teachings, one must wonder how Joseph Smith could claim that the Book of Mormon was another testament of Jesus Christ. Well, we cannot believe both the Bible and the writings of Joseph Smith when the Bible tells us there is only one God, and Joseph Smith tells us there are many gods, and we must become gods ourselves. Let's examine the teachings of both men on the afterlife. You just don't pay lip service to Jesus. You enter into Him. You become a part of Him. You absorb, you identify completely with His suffering on the cross, His resurrection from the dead, His claims to be the Son of God and therefore qualified to pay the price we could never pay. And once we believe in Him in that deep sense of commitment, which can be instantaneous, in fact it has to be, at that moment we have eternal life. In Christianity, eternal life is a gift. It's the most radical understanding of how one goes to heaven, is resurrected, has eternal life in, in the religious realm. Um, by grace you're saved through faith. It is the gift of God. Why is it a gift? Because Jesus Christ did something that we couldn't do for ourselves. He died on the cross, satisfied God's sense of justice against sin, paid the price for our sins, was raised eternally through the resurrection with a glorified body. When we put our faith and trust in Him, repenting of sins and believing in Him, we receive salvation as a gift. That's why the thief on the cross could be saved. Joseph Smith's revelation in section 76 of the DNC describes three degrees of glory for all mankind and how to obtain each degree. The third and lowest kingdom is the telestial, the glory of the stars. According to Joseph Smith, this kingdom is for the liars and adulterers and sorcerers and whoremongers and whosoever loves and makes a lie. The terrestrial degree of glory is the middle kingdom and is inhabited by those who died without the law. They accepted Jesus in the spirit world. 
They are the honorable men of the earth who were blinded by the craftiness of men. The celestial kingdom is the highest kingdom. This is where God reigns upon his throne forever and ever. Having received his fullness and his grace, equal in power and might and in dominion, they are gods, even the sons of God. In Romans 6.23, it talks about although the wages of sin is death, the gift of God, the gift is eternal life. In order to gain access into the celestial heaven, Joseph Smith's revelation requires keeping the Ten Commandments, as well as all the commandments found throughout the three sacred Mormon books, be baptized into the Mormon church, tithe, get married in the temple, obey the word of wisdom, be baptized for the dead, magnify the church callings, and the list goes on. It is only by trusting him that we come to be able to enjoy the glory of heaven. I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one, not one person comes to the Father but through me. There is no religion in the world that believes this except the religion of the Bible because every religion in the world says we just have to do something to contribute. We have to earn our way. We have to somehow please God with ourselves and our attitudes and our words and deeds. Impossible. According to the Bible, repenting of our sins and faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to gain eternal life. In John, Jesus was asked, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. In fact, the Bible refutes the ordinances in Joseph Smith's Articles of Faith by stating, for by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Joseph Smith said, I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It is Jesus who has been building his church for 2,000 years. Joseph Smith's Doctrine and Covenants teaches that Joseph himself holds the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And if Joseph Smith holds the keys to heaven, then how can Jesus claim, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth? God's word tells us that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. In stark contrast, Brigham Young stated, no man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. In the Bible, it is clear that our salvation rests in the hands of Jesus Christ alone. Why? Because from the beginning, God's word tells us that the penalty for all sin is death, both physical death and spiritual separation from God. To pay this penalty, a person must be sinless, be infinite to pay the infinite penalty for mankind's sin, die as a substitute by shedding of blood to pay sin's penalty, and rise from the dead to defeat sin and death. No other person could do what Jesus did. Therefore, only faith in Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection can save a sinner. Can we know that we have eternal life? Scripture states, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. With such astonishing differences between the Word of God and the Word of Joseph Smith, it's not surprising that many are confused. Only one can be the true Word of God. So how do we determine which book contains the truth? There are many ways to prove the validity of the Word of God. 
two of which are the physical facts found in archaeology and the spiritual truths found in prophecy. Let's examine these areas and compare the facts. Joseph Smith's writings are now over 150 years old. If they are true, then they should be easily validated by historical and archaeological evidences. However, BYU professor D. Green confesses, no book of Mormon location is known with reference to modern topography. Biblical archaeology can be studied because we know where Jerusalem and Jericho are, but we do not know where Zarahemla and Bountiful were or are, or any other Book of Mormon location for that matter. It would seem that a concentration on geography should be the first order of business, but we have already seen that 20 years of such an approach has left us empty-handed. Mormon apostle Mark E. Peterson stated in his book, Way of the Master, the Bible is so full of errors one can hardly believe a word in it. However, as we researched the Bible, we found that there are over 25,000 evidences, including biblical sites, cities, empires, artifacts, weapons, raw materials, and more on record, which have been located and verified by using the scriptures as a guide. In fact, many biblical cities still exist today. In contrast, not one artifact from the Book of Mormon has ever been found. Not one city, not one empire, not one weapon of any kind. Not even one coin, which were noted as being common in Joseph's writings. In producing the Bible versus the Book of Mormon video, we traveled around the world. We went to the Middle East and, and talked to people. We went to Central America, around this country, and we uh, just asked the basic question of experts in archaeology and anthropology. And in all cases, uh, for the Bible, uh, we saw the historical reliability of the biblical account. And for uh, Joseph Smith's writings, um, it was non-existent. There was nothing. We could find nothing. Joseph Smith claimed there were huge cities, 38 cities in the Americas. Huge cities, and yet not one single city has ever been dug up. When you go to Israel, you find all kinds of biblical cities. You can find where Jerusalem is even today. You know where Bethlehem is even today. We have historical artifacts, we have the written language, we have engravings, we have cities. You can study Hebrew and Greek. And yet when we looked at the Book of Mormon, we found none of these things checked out. There were no inscriptions for the Book of Mormon people. There was no group of people you could identify as the Book of Mormon peoples. There's not a location that you can identify as a Book of Mormon site. The Mormon church won't even commit itself to a map of where the Book of Mormon was supposed to have happened. I would think if this is such a great faith that's going to change people's lives for eternity, that we would be able to have some kind of source for the information of which it's built upon that we can see. How about some archaeology? Where is this? No one's ever found any archaeological evidence to support the stories of Mormonism. It's all myth. Nowhere will you find a Mormon map that tells you where these cities are because they didn't exist. And when you base your faith on something, you're going to spend eternity either in heaven or hell. Would you want to base your eternity on something that is totally unknown? According to the Book of Mormon, on Hill Cumorah in Palmyra, New York, where Joseph once lived, there was said to have been a great battle between the Lamanites and the Nephites. In this war, there were tens of thousands of men who died in battle. However, to this day, not one artifact has been found from this mighty war. In fact, during the time period described in the Book of Mormon in which the battle took place, the Americas did not have the ability to produce the metal weapons described. The evidence to support Joseph's writings simply does not exist. Joseph Smith bore many titles in his lifetime, but he is probably best known as the prophet. His many prophecies both warned and inspired his followers. Here are a few of the many prophecies of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith told of the inhabitants of the moon as being about six foot tall, dressed like Quakers, and living to be about a thousand years old. 
Since Neil Armstrong's walk on the moon in 1969, we now know there are no Quaker-looking people on the moon. Later, Brigham Young further expanded on Joseph Smith's idea by stating the sun was inhabited. The city of New Jerusalem, which city shall be built beginning at the temple lot, which is appointed by the finger of the Lord in the western boundaries of the state of Missouri and dedicated by the hand of Joseph Smith, beginning at this place, even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation. It's interesting because Jesus spoke prophetically about the temple in Jerusalem, and he said uh, that there won't be one stone standing on top of another. In other words, this is th these beautiful buildings that you see here will be completely destroyed, which of course happened after Jesus' death in AD 70. Well, you can go there today, as we did um, in our research, and you can stand there, and there it is. It's destroyed. It's been that way since 70 AD. Well, you can go to Independence, Missouri as well, which we did, where, where Joseph Smith said that a temple will be built here uh, in this generation, in his generation. And uh, you can go there and look, and there's no temple. It's a flat field. Verily, thus saith the Lord, it is wisdom in my servant David W. Patton that he settle up all his business as soon as he possibly can and make a disposition of his merchandise, that he may perform a mission unto me next spring in company with others, even 12, including himself, to testify of my name and bear glad tidings unto the world. If you do some research on this and study what the history says, it tells us that David W. Patton died at the Battle of Crooked River in the fall of that year. So in the spring, he didn't go on his mission. I've heard excuses made for this passage that state that, well, maybe he went to the spirit world. But that's not what the passage states. It doesn't state he went to the spirit world. I've heard excuses that say, well, maybe he wasn't being obedient to the Lord in the battle and he, he turned and ran. But that's not the case either. He was actually chasing down the enemy when he got shot in the chest and died. And he died in good standing with the Mormon church. Um, the excuses I don't think hold any water because in Doctrine and Covenants chapter 1, it, st it says this, Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servant, it is the same. And this passage just says that you can't make any excuses for a prophecy that doesn't come true. If it doesn't come true, then it proves that it was a false prophecy. Even if a person does have a prophecy or a vision that comes to pass, God warns in Deuteronomy chapter 13, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder of which he spoke to you comes to pass, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The biblical requirement for God's prophets is 100% accuracy. Deuteronomy 18, 21 through 22 states, You may say in your heart, How will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. Here God tells his people how to discern deception by someone claiming to be a prophet. If even one prophecy does not come true, he is considered a false prophet. Why is God so concerned about false prophecy? Obviously because when a man says, I am speaking for God, and what he says is not true, then that blasphems the God of the Bible. That says the omniscient God doesn't know what he's talking about, that he lied. So therefore God cannot have anyone who says I'm speaking for God give a false prophecy representing him. 
Joseph even prophesied the coming of the Lord, which according to Jesus is impossible. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Even so, this is what Oliver Cowdery recorded in 1835. President Smith then stated that the meeting had been called because God had commanded it, and it was made known to him by vision and by the Holy Spirit. It was the will of God that they should be ordained to the ministry and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time, for the coming of the Lord, which was nigh, even 56 years should wind up the scene. The 56th year passed in 1891. Remember, it only takes one false prophecy for a man to be a false prophet. There are over 300 prophecies concerning the life, mission, death, and resurrection of the Redeemer. Only the Bible lays out mankind's history and precisely details the life of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith, Prophet of the Restoration, is the latest film being shown in LDS Welcome Centers across the country and depicts Joseph Smith as a wonderful family man who is persecuted for his beliefs, but prevails due to his tremendous faith and miraculous works. Joseph is even shown healing the sick in Nauvoo. Although this film is very emotional and inspiring, it has no more reality to it than any other fictional story created by Hollywood. Let's now examine the historical documents about the true character of Joseph Smith. At the age of 14, Joseph claimed to have a vision where God and Jesus appeared to him and instructed him not to join any of the surrounding churches. An amazing experience like this should radically change a person's life. But by the age of 21, Joseph was arrested and brought before a judge in Bainbridge, New York for deceiving Josiah Stowell, charged for glass looking and set before the court as a disorderly person. The next year, he falls for Emma Hale, a girl at whose home he lodged while on his treasure digging work. Joseph's young wife, Emma, will prove to be a companion of such loyalty that the thought of breaking the heart of a woman like this would be unthinkable for most men, but not for Joseph Smith. Within a few short years, even men who were closest to Joseph, like David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, William Law, and William McClellan, were repulsed by Joseph Smith's multiple adulteries and publicly declared Joseph an adulterer. God's word warns, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor thieves will inherit the kingdom of God. Sadly, one of the LDS church historians, Andrew Jensen, listed 27 women who were sealed to Joseph Smith. In an 1838 letter, Oliver Cowdery calls Joseph Smith's adultery with Fanny Alger a dirty, nasty, filthy affair. In 1843, Joseph Smith had a revelation and penned D&C section 132, outlining the necessity of entering into a new and everlasting covenant of plural marriage. LDS historian Andrew Jensen, in the historical record, claims that Joseph Smith did eventually convince Emma that plural marriage was of the Lord. However, Joseph Smith failed to inform Emma that two months earlier, he had married both of the Partridge sisters. Warren Jeffs has been wanted by the FBI. He's been profiled on America's Most Wanted. He's been in the headlines a lot lately, and the Mormon Church tries real hard to distance themselves from him. The amazing thing to me is that Warren Jeffs simply is following in the footsteps of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith married underage girls. Joseph Smith went to other women and said that their salvation was dependent upon them entering into plural marriage. Uh, Joseph Smith went to other men's wives and said that God had revealed to him that uh, they were supposed to be his spiritual wife. So all these behaviors that we find so horrific about Warren Jeffs, we find the same characteristic and behavior in the prophet Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church. I do believe that there are some that 
look to the example of Solomon and or David as an example for uh, a biblical proof for the authorization of marrying multiple wives. When, when we look at their lives, they were in clear disobedience to the commandment of God. Hundreds of years before Solomon or David ever came on the scene, God had warned the nation of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, he told them, when you establish a king, make sure that your king does not gather to himself multiple wives. So when we look at Solomon and we look at David, we find out they were in direct disobedience. Amazingly, Joseph Smith's successor, Brigham Young, revealed that your godhood rests on the act of polygamy, saying, the only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. If you read section 132 in the Doctrine and Covenants now, uh, it's the only section that teaches um, the, the concept of eternal marriage. And uh, it also teaches polygamy in the same section. And that's the reason why you can't really separate polygamy from eternal marriage that Mormons talk a lot about now. It's, it's right in their own scripture. Jesus made it clear that God designed marriage for one man and one woman for life. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Furthermore, the Bible repeatedly commands that a Christian leader is to be the husband of only one wife. In 1842, he married, in an eight-month period, 11 women, took a five-month break, and then in 1843, he married 14 women, five of which he married in the month of May alone. So when we understand the timeline in which Joseph Smith married these women, how quickly he was marrying women, we see that Joseph Smith had a voracious appetite for a new sexual partner. Joseph Smith recorded several different accounts of his first vision in an American prophet's record, the diaries and journals of Joseph Smith. Smith's earliest account mentions Jesus appearing, but does not include God the Father. Some have an angel appearing, while others have multiple angels. But the official vision of the LDS Church has God the Father and Jesus appearing. However, since this vision is dated prior to Smith's ordination to the priesthood, this would conflict with Joseph's writings in section 84, where he says, without the authority of the priesthood, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Even so, there are nine varying accounts of this divine first vision, differing on the date, who appeared, and what the message was. The first vision is considered the foundation and cornerstone of the Mormon religion. It is the turning point when Joseph Smith became a prophet of God and began his life's work of turning Christians away from the false churches that had been created after the decline of the apostolic church. And yet the discrepancy of these visions and the lack of unity between the LDS church of today and Brigham Young leaves us questioning the authenticity of Joseph's first vision. Our whole strength rests on the validity of that vision. It either occurred or it did not occur. If it did not, then this work is a fraud. If it did, then it is the most important and wonderful work under the heavens. The amazing thing about those who have placed their trust in Joseph Smith, they must understand that he was a 14-year-old boy when he supposedly first had this visitation, and that 
the kinds of stories that he proclaimed, well, he was known around the country as a fabricator of stories. His own mother was somewhat concerned. And when he got married, his father-in-law didn't really want anything to do with him because he was known as a fabricator of stories. When we was investigating the first vision, this was supposed to be a monumental thing to the Mormon church. But then we found out there's different versions of it that the church didn't tell us about. They've got one standardized version now that uh, you can find in most of the Mormon literature that is up to date now. But uh, to me, that something that was so monumental, if, if God was to come and talk to me, I, I think I could probably get most of the story straight. The founding claim of Mormonism is that in 1820, God and Jesus appeared to Joseph Smith to prepare him for the ministry of bringing forth the true church in the last days. However, we find historically that he told many different accounts of that experience. The dates differ, the uh, uh, who appears differs, the message that's given to him differs, and so when we examine those things, it doesn't sound like someone relating a real experience. It is most likely these inconsistencies which led Brigham Young in 1855 to preach a sermon in which he denied that the Lord came to Joseph Smith in the first vision. Young stated that Joseph had actually been visited by an angel, which informed him that he should not join any of the religious sects of the day. According to Wesley Walters' booklet, New Light on Mormon Origins, Joseph Smith continually changed the accounts of his vision depending on whom he was talking to at the time. There should be no confusion about where and when such a heavenly event took place. Did Joseph Smith actually have a vision? Or did he build an entire religion upon his known talent of storytelling? If big buildings and uh, money and financial power and prestige in the world is the thing and programs, the Mormon church is way ahead, no question. But if it's about the truth, if that's what ultimately all this is about, the Mormon church fails miserably. And it starts with their founder, Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, his father Joseph Sr., and his brother Hiram were actively involved in the occult while living in Palmyra, New York. Joseph Sr. considered his money digging an occupation and often brought Joseph Jr. with him on his expeditions. This involved special rituals and ceremonies which were performed for the purpose of obtaining buried treasure. It is through these expeditions that Joseph found his beloved seer stone which he used to try to locate treasures of gold and silver. Joseph would place his magical rock into a hat and pull the hat up to his face to block out all light. By doing this, he claimed he could see supernaturally and would help those who were digging by locating the place where the treasure was buried and observing the spirits that were guarding it. Joseph and his father's money digging continued until at least March of 1826. On March 15, 1842, Joseph joined the Masons, which is an organization that believes Jesus is not divine and is on the same level as Buddha, Muhammad, or any other religious teacher. Within one day, Smith rose to the highest degree, which is the sublime degree. Joseph's Masonic membership affected the development of the Mormon church in many ways, but the most significant area appears to be in the development of the Mormon temple ceremonies. On May 4, 1842, only two months after joining the Masons, Joseph introduced the temple endowment ceremony. LDS historian Dr. Reed Durham had this to say about the Masonic influence on the Mormon religion. There is absolutely no question in my mind that the Mormon ceremony, which came to be known as the endowment, introduced by Joseph Smith to Mormon Masons, had an immediate inspiration from Masonry. It is also obvious that the Nauvoo Temple architecture was in part Masonically influenced. Indeed, it appears that there was an intentional attempt to utilize Masonic symbols and motifs. 
I suggest that enough evidence presently exists to declare the entire institution of the political kingdom of God, including the Council of Fifty, the Living Constitution, the proposed flag of the kingdom, and the anointing and coronation of the king, had its genesis in connection with Masonic thoughts and ceremonies. It appears that the prophet first embraced Masonry, and then in the process, he modified, expanded, amplified, or glorified it. Dr. Durham also said, included in the actual vocabulary of Joseph Smith's counsel and instructions to the sisters were such words as ancient orders, examinations, degrees, candidates, secrets, lodges, rules, signs, tokens, order of the priesthood, and keys, all indicating that the society's orientation possessed Masonic overtones. In April of 1974, Dr. Durham announced an important find, not realizing the implication of his discovery. In his presidential address to the Mormon History Association, he spoke of yet another interesting occultic article called the Jupiter Talisman, which was described by Joseph's wife, Emma, as one of the prophet's intimate possessions. Dr. Durham had this to say about the mystical powers of the talisman. When properly invoked, with Jupiter being very powerful and ruling in the heavens, these intelligences by the power of ancient magic guaranteed to the possessor of this talisman the gain of riches and favor and power and love and peace and to confirm honors and dignities and counsels. Talismatic magic further declared that anyone who worked skillfully with this Jupiter table would obtain the power of stimulating anyone to offer his love to the possessor of the talisman, whether from a friend, brother, relative, or even any female. In the same address, Dr. Durham also stated, in some very real and quite mysterious sense, this particular table of Jupiter was the most appropriate talisman for Joseph Smith to possess. Indeed, it seemed meant for him because on all levels of interpretation, planetary, mythological, numerological, astrological, mystical Kabbalism, and talismatic magic, the prophet was in every case appropriately described. This is a very significant finding because we keep close to us the things which we find important. And for Joseph, that was riches, power, and his love of women. We know that these were the beliefs of Joseph Smith right up until he took his last breath. This talisman was found in Joseph's pocket the day he died in Carthage. Another thing that was really interesting in studying the roots of Mormonism was to find out that Joseph Smith wore a Jupiter's talisman and uh, his brother Hiram had the family parchment and they kept those on their bodies hidden. Another thing that most Mormons do not realize was that Brigham Young was cut from the same cloth. He wore a bloodstone around his neck as protection until the day he died. One indication we have uh, as an insight into Joseph Smith's character is the value he placed in a particular magic object called a Jupiter's talisman that he had had through his life. We aren't sure just when he first got it, but evidently as a teenager. But he kept it on his person until his death. And a Jupiter's talisman is a magic object that one would use to uh, empower one with uh, money, finances, uh, power over people, power over women. All of these things were items Joseph's life was geared towards. He wanted power, he wanted money, and he wanted women. Uh, the fact that he died with the Jupiter talisman on his body shows that throughout his life, he continued to hang on to that hope and that trust in that magic object. Drastically different than that portrayed in the latest film, Joseph Smith, Prophet of the Restoration, the Book of Mormon was not translated from the golden plates. According to his scribes, the plates were usually either hidden in the woods or covered by a cloth in the room during translation. 
However, Joseph Smith actually did his translating by looking into a magical peepstone placed into a hat. Why would God and the angel Moroni preserve the golden plates for over 1,400 years to be disregarded during the translation process? As we found out, this was not the only time the peepstone method was used by Joseph Smith. In 1826, four years before the publication of the Book of Mormon, Joseph was arrested and charged for using his peepstone method to deceive the elderly Josiah Stowell while attempting to locate buried treasure on his farm. Here is the method Joseph used to translate the golden plates according to David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon and one of the secretaries Joseph Smith used to dictate the Book of Mormon. I will now give you a description of the manner in which the Book of Mormon was translated. Joseph would put the seer stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around the face to exclude the light, and in the darkness the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear, and under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery who was the principal scribe, and when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear. And another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, and not by any power of man. This translation method was affirmed by David Whitmer, Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, and Emma Smith, among others. And it is this unbiblical method of translation that Joseph Smith boasted the bold claim that the Book of Mormon was the most accurate book in existence. If this book was translated by the gift and power of God, we must ask the question, why have there been thousands of corrections to the Book of Mormon, many of which relate to doctrinal and historical issues? The Bible tells us that all scriptures given by inspiration of God and that prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, God's Spirit directly inspired the prophets to write the scriptures. Biblical revelations never involved occult rituals or objects. Since the golden plates were not used during translation, Joseph Smith was the only person who could verify that they truly existed. Initially, Joseph's witnesses vouched for Joseph and the golden plates. But when pressed by the public, Joseph's witnesses stated that they saw the golden plates through the eyes of faith and never physically saw or handled them. More importantly, Joseph was using the same occult object to find buried treasure as he used to translate his scripture. Why wouldn't the original gold plates, why wasn't that uh, put on display so people can see. And uh, their answer was that because it's sacred. I said, well, what is sacred? Uh, the cold? Because obviously if you can have what, the cold, what was written on the cold blades, it only leaves, leaves the material itself, the gold. Is that sacred? Joseph Smith claimed that an angel told him the, the plates of the record for the Book of Mormon were in a hill and he was to translate these by the power of God. And yet from his story and those around him we find that the method he used to translate was actually a magical stone that he already had possessed before he got the plates. And he used this magical practice to decipher supposedly the translation off the plates. Paul said to the Galatians, here is somebody who had been given the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he had heard that they started to believe another gospel. And it pained him because here was a shepherd who had loved these people, and he saw that they had begun to mix the truth with some sort of false doctrine. And he wrote to them in Galatians chapter 1, he said, listen, listen to me, please. If somebody comes to you with any other gospel, any other doctrine, even if I do it, another person, or an angel from heaven, 
just like Moroni. He says, it is, a, is not a real gospel, it's a false gospel. Let that person be accursed. So it's interesting how some people would go from the Bible to another gospel, such as is in the Book of Mormon, and it's interesting that the Book of Mormon is subtitled, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. The issue is, if what Joseph said conflicted with what's, what the Bible says, then he wasn't getting inspiration from God. On April 23rd, 1843, six bell-shaped brass plates covered with undecipherable engravings were unearthed near Kinderhook, Illinois, 70 miles south of Nauvoo. These plates have come to be known as the Kinderhook plates. Soon after their discovery, the plates were taken to Joseph Smith to be examined and translated. Here is a statement from Joseph Smith as recorded in the History of the Church, May 1st, 1843. I have translated a portion of them and find they contain the history of the person with whom they were found. He was a descendant of Ham, through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. In 1980, an LDS history professor, Stanley B. Kimball, secured permission to subject a remaining plate to a series of tests to prove their validity. He had the plate examined by the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at Northwestern University using a scanning electron microscope and an X-ray fluorescence analysis. Professor Kimball described the results of the test in the official Mormon church publication, The Ensign, August 1981, pages 66 through 70. A recent electronic and chemical analysis of a metal plate brought in 1843 to the prophet Joseph Smith appears to solve a previously unanswered question in church history, helping to further evidence that the plate is what its producers later said it was. A 19th century attempt to lure Joseph Smith into making a translation of ancient looking characters that had been etched into the plates. These test results validate Wilbur Fugate's later testimony in 1879 to a hoax where he and two other men cut out thin pieces of metal and etched markings on them using beeswax and acid to test Joseph Smith. Kimball laid to rest the question that had been posed to LDS leaders in the Mormon community for over 130 years. The Kinderhook plates, which were found authentic and partially translated by Joseph Smith, were a hoax. The introduction page in the Book of Mormon says after thousands of years all were destroyed except the Lamanites and they are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. The Lamanites are described by Joseph as ancestors to the Israelites inhabiting all of North and South America from sea to sea. In the Book of Proverbs we are told every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. If it could be proven absolutely that the American Indians were not descendants of the Lamanites, then Joseph Smith perpetrated a gigantic fraud in the very book he claimed was inspired from God, the Book of Mormon. Well, such irrefutable evidence has been found using one of our strongest technological discoveries, DNA. Prisoners are routinely freed from crimes they supposedly committed many years before when scientific experts prove conclusively that the DNA found on the victim did not match the DNA of the convict. DNA science now allows us to determine the relatedness of different populations around the world. When the Y chromosomes or mitochondrial DNA are tested in hundreds or even thousands of individuals from two different races, the results can be compared to see how similar or dissimilar these intact DNA markers are between people groups. In the Americas, DNA testing of over 5,000 Indians within 150 different tribes has been completed. When the overwhelming evidence was compiled, it was discovered that not one person contained DNA that was of Hebrew descent. The result? 
Indians were found to be of Asian descent. It's not an issue. The DNA issue of whether Native Americans are, come from a Hebrew descent is not an issue. Uh, once you get outside of Mormonism, it is not an issue. It is not a debate. Nobody is debating out in the scientific realm of whether or not uh, Native Americans came from Israelites. Nobody. Nobody. Or Middle Easterners. Nobody. In order to be a Mormon, one must trust in the stories of Joseph Smith. And if these stories can be proven to have been fabricated or untrue, then the very basis of their faith is erroneous. Modern science has conclusively proven Joseph to be a deceiver in his allegation that the Indians were descendants of the Hebrews. Sadly, this is just one of the many lies fabricated by Joseph Smith. For generations, scholars have shown irrefutable evidence that the Book of Mormon, as well as the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price, are fallible, faulty documents, contradicting each other as well as contradicting the Bible. It has been well documented that the Book of Abraham, which Joseph claimed was translated from an Egyptian language on papyri, was also completely false. We have not found one non-LDS Egyptologist who supports his translation. I first became aware that the Book of Abraham had a problem when I'd been studying other Mormon literature and anthropology and realized that the story that Joseph Smith told about it just did not make sense and it just did not correlate. There were so many other problems with the Book of Mormon and with other claims that Joseph Smith had made that the Book of Abraham seemed fantastic. And it struck me as particularly odd since Egyptology is such a known science. Since the papyri had been rediscovered and were available for study, there should be Egyptologists being struck between the eyes like a bolt of thunder on the road to Damascus and converting to join the Mormon church once they found out that Joseph Smith had translated these before anyone could even translate Egyptian. <laughs> of course, the, the truth was that the Egyptologists knew perfectly well that the Book of Abraham contained nothing that Joseph Smith ever said it did. Part of the papyri translated by Joseph allegedly shows a priest about to sacrifice Abraham on an altar. But in reality, it has been discovered that the papyri actually depicts a common funeral text many centuries after Abraham's time. Egyptologists uniformly agree on this conclusion, destroying Joseph Smith's translation of the Book of Abraham. We can only conclude from this evidence that this book was an elaborate fraud by Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was a liar. Again, again, he lied. Joseph Smith said that there were cities all over America that held many, many people in South and Central America. Not one city has ever been found, not one crumb, not one remain. And yet in the Bible, multitudes of cities have been found, just as the Bible said. Joseph Smith was a complete deceiver. He deceived people into believing that he had a revelation from God when he did not. The book of Abraham has been proven false, and Joseph Smith along with it. The DNA evidence showed he was false about what he said, that the Lamanites and then the Indians descended from Israel, from the Jews. It was proven they did not. He lied about that. He was a liar from the very beginning. He was a false prophet. Do you want to follow a man like this? Do you want to know truth about who God is and how to know him and how to be with him forever? Then listen to this book, which is free of error because God can't lie. He makes no mistakes. Trust me, friend, just open this and read it for yourself. Don't let people tell you that. You find out for yourself your eternal destiny is at stake. It's a question of what the truth is. It's a question of what the evidence is. It's a question of did a man come along 1,800 years into the history of Christianity and totally revise the, what Christianity says and what the Bible says? And that's what we believe Joseph Smith did. Therefore, I would uh, greatly encourage any Mormon or any person who's thinking about Mormonism to examine objectively the life of Joseph Smith, the reliability and the teachings of the Book of Mormon over against the Jesus 
of the New Testament and the reliability of the Bible and its truthfulness. The Mormon people are a precious people. They're worth the battle. They're worth fighting for. They, uh, there's a tremendous amount of respect that I have for them and their dedication and how hard they're seeking and the burden that they're willing to carry in their, their impossible attempt to live up to their impossible gospel demands. And we're fighting for the Mormon people because we love them and because we want, we want them to see the glory of Christ and his true glory. And uh, we want them to escape this, this lie. One of the things that I tell our congregation almost every Sunday is you have sermon notes. Virtually every verse I quote in scripture is on there because you need to go home and check me out. You need to see what the Bible has to say, not what John says, not what Joseph says, not what anybody says, but God. What does God say about these issues? You need to check these things out. It is your soul, your eternal soul that is on the line. And there is no reset button at the judgment. There is no finger pointing, but he misled me. You have an obligation for the sake of your soul, as well as to be able to share the truth with your family, people you love, to check out what God's word has to say on these issues and not what somebody else had to say. And the answers are found only in the word of God, which is the Bible. What I've discovered is when you counter Mormon theology with biblical fact and you back them up into a corner, they most always go back to, well, I've experienced the testimony. And so when you ask them, well, what do you mean by the testimony? Is that the burning in the bosom? They say, yes, of course. And you too could have the experience of the burning in the bosom. All you need to do is ask God if what Joseph Smith said is true. Now, isn't this amazing to stake your eternal life based on some kind of a feeling, a subjective feeling, where would you find that in the scriptures? Absolutely nowhere. My faith that I will be spending eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ is dependent upon understanding who he is and what he's done. The shed blood of Jesus Christ, his life was sacrificed upon the cross, his blood was shed, he died, he's resurrected, he lives today. And if I would believe in him and who he is and what he's done and acknowledge who I am and what I've done and ask for forgiveness, then I can spend eternity with him. It has nothing to do with a burning in the bosom. Everybody wants to make religion so hard and they want to put so many tags and so many things and label it of so many things and yet religion is so easy. All you have to do is believe in Christ and be saved and, and confess it and then that's it. You can, you can go live with God then. It don't have to be, I've got to join this church, and then on top of that, I've got to pay my tithing to get a temple recommend, and then i got to have a temple recommend to get into the temple, and then i got to go to the temple so that I can live with God, so that I can become a God, so I can go have a planet to not be with God. It just don't make sense. Um, when it came to leaving the Mormon church, um, I had a position back in the primary with the kids on the presidency. I was over the music teaching the kids the music and we made little posters and had the words and pictures and stuff for them. And we were going over a particular song that morning. It was called Follow the Prophet. And I remember looking out into the audience and seeing my, my two girls, my kids, faces looking at me, teaching them this song. And that's just what did it to me. You know, I thought to myself, I'm teaching these kids, let alone my own kids, this song about a prophet that I don't even believe is true, something that is not even right. And that, that just did something to me that day. And that, that is the Sunday that I went home and we never went back. Why would you trust Joseph Smith over the Bible? What is the criteria for testing a prophet? Let's look at that. And I would hope the person would then be able to see Joseph Smith doesn't deserve the honor and recognition that they've always given to him. He doesn't measure up against what God said in the Bible. I remember the words of John. When he wrote that letter, here was a guy who was incredibly in love with the people that he was ministering to. 
And whenever he spoke to those people, you could tell he was speaking from his heart. And he had one desire, and that one desire, he said, was, I have no greater joy, no greater joy than to see my children walking in truth. And I think that would be my heart, my heart to see that people could know the truth. Because Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And so my heart is that any Mormon who would uh, be hearing this would be going back to the scripture, challenging the words of Joseph Smith, comparing them to the words of Jesus, the one who died for you, the one who loves you, the one who is praying for you right now, interceding. He ever lives to make intercession for you right now. And I'm sure that if you do that, if you truly seek him out in the Bible, I'm sure that Jesus would begin to speak to you and you would know the truth. Now, I just ask you a, a simple question. Uh, do you want to trust Joseph Smith, who is a fraud, a womanizer, many wives, false prophet, uh, the Book of Mormon? There's nothing to support it. All the evidence is to the contrary. Or would you trust Jesus Christ, who is the Savior, who is God, who became a man? And the Bible is supported by hundreds, even thousands of prophecies, proofs, evidence, history, archaeology. We can prove it. Now, where do you want to rest your hope for eternity? In Joseph Smith or in Jesus Christ and his word? I was born and raised a Mormon for 37 years. I, my life was built around the Mormon church, no question about it. Um, everything I did centered on the idea of how can I serve the church. School took a back seat, work took a back seat, everything took a back seat to the church, including as I look back my family. When it came upon me that they had lied to me, that the Mormon church was not what it purported to be, that Joseph Smith was not the man that they were putting and promoting him forward to be, <clears throat> I, was, I was devastated. Uh, I remember sitting on the edge of my bed and weeping uh, as a recognition that I'd been lied to uh, crept in upon me. I remember thinking other things in the, in the following days and some of those things were, I just want to forget all this because if I go any further with this, it means that for 37 years, I've been wrong. I didn't want to face that. I just didn't want to do it. For those of you that might be facing this, at this time, I would just encourage you. I have no regrets. When Jesus says, if the Son set you free, you should be free indeed, He really means it. The thing that broke forth on me was that the Bible really is the real thing. There's no fantasy to it. It reveals reality to us. As we have seen, the character of Joseph Smith shows through time after time. From his fabrication of the first vision to his reconstruction of the Christian faith and his desire for women, it is clear that Joseph centered his life around lust, wealth, and power. Joseph Smith joins a long list of those who have used the name of Christ to enrich themselves. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus spoke many times about the sinful nature of man being prevalent in the quest for riches, power, and lust. Jesus alone is without sin, as we read in 1 John 3, 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Only Jesus could live a sinless life. God pronounced to Adam and Eve and to every man since, the soul who sins shall die. In the Old Testament, a perfect spotless lamb was offered to God in order to cover a person's sin. However, these animal sacrifices did not wash away sin, but pointed us to the coming Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice, perfect in every way. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. In John, God tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. When comparing Joseph Smith to Jesus Christ, there is no comparison. If someone were to model their life after Jesus, their attributes would include love, kindness, humility, and compassion. If someone today would model their life after Joseph Smith, they would have to be an adulterer, a thief, a fraud, and a liar. It's no coincidence that Joseph was murdered in the Carthage jail. Why was Joseph in jail? He destroyed a small paper press called the Nauvoo Expositor because he didn't like what they had written about him in their one and only publication. But this was not the first time Joseph was arrested. He had been arrested many times throughout his adult life for things like defrauding people while he was using his glass looking techniques and creating an illegal bank in Kirtland, Ohio and fleeing with its monies. So why do so many people follow this man? Because they don't know the truth about the character of Joseph Smith. As a Mormon, you cannot question the church on issues such as these because you run the risk of excommunication. If you don't believe the things stated in this program, look them up for yourself. Ask questions of your leaders and gauge their responses. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, why would we fear man when only God can destroy our bodies and our souls? Friends, your eternity rests on your decision. You must choose to follow Joseph or follow Jesus, but you cannot follow both. This video has been sent to Mormon leaders, knowing that they will try to destroy and discredit its message, but this will not change the fact that the content within is true. LDS leaders, I urge you to think about the fact that you're leading your people down a dark path to hell and to the eternal lake of fire. But you have the opportunity right now, as Moses did when he led the children of God out of Egypt, to lead multitudes to the true Savior, Jesus Christ, and to an eternity in heaven. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, Call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Do not trust your eternity to a burning in the bosom which can be felt by simply watching a Hollywood movie. Even terrorists believe and are willing to die for something which is not of the Lord. It is our prayer that you take the time to honestly seek the truth for the sake of you and your family. Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith, choose. choose. My dear LDS leaders, academics, and friends, our heart goes out to you. You're responsible for many people, millions of people, and if you lead them and they follow you, they may follow you to the lake of fire without God and without hope. Listen, we pray, and this film is aimed at you as the book that accompanies the film is aimed at you. We want you to come to Christ and like Moses of old, lead your people out of Egypt. You can do it. You'd be the hero of all time to the LDS people if you finally admitted Joseph Smith was a false prophet. Beloved, you know that, that Mormonism is not true. The Book of Mormon is not true. Joseph Smith was not true. Joseph Smith deceived you and deceived your people. Don't go on with this deception. So we pray of you, Mormon leaders, have the courage to admit that you're wrong. We don't want to lead Mormons to Christ, but even more so, we want you to lead your people out of Mormonism and to Jesus Christ and do away with these false prophecies and do away with this false prophet Joseph Smith. One thing you can do, LDS friends, and we pray you will, get into the book of John and read carefully. It was written so that you might believe. Get into the book of John. But even now, you can call on the Lord Jesus Christ and simply say, I'm confused. I want to know Jesus, the biblical Jesus. I want to be saved. 
Lord Jesus Christ, please save me. To confirm that, we have some verses that you might want to read. And one of them is Romans 10, 9, and 10. Another is Romans 10, 13. And we pray that you'll look at those verses and read them and come out of Mormonism and let Jesus save you. How do you get saved? You simply call on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing he died for your sins, believing he's the eternal God, believing he rose again from the dead, believing that right now he's alive and loves you, and will come into your heart and change your life and take away all the fog and confusion about Mormonism. Come to Jesus and pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to be saved. Come into my heart and life, Lord Jesus. Save me from my sin. Make me a child of God. I now receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, dear LDS leaders, do that and then lead your people out. But give me 